ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया श्रीमद् भागवतम कैंटो 10 चैप्टर 7 चैप्टर्स एंटाइटल्ड द किलिंग ऑफ द डीमन त्रिनवार्ता टेक्स्ट नंबर 28 गालगहान निश्चेस्तो हो दायित्य निर्गत लोचना हा आव्यक्ता रावो न्याप्यातत साहबालो व्यसुर व्रजे गालगहान निश्चेस्तो हो दायित्य निर्गत लोचना हा Avyakta Ravu Nyapatat Sahabhalo Vyasur Vrajay Galagrahana Nischestoho Daicho Nirgata Lochanaha Avyakta Ravu Nyapatat Sahabhalo Vyasur Vrajay Ladies, Gala Grahana Nischesta. Because of Krishna grasping the neck of the demon, Trinavarta, the demon choked and could not do anything. Daicha, the demon. Nirgata Lochanaha. His eyes popped out because of pressure. Rivo. <laughs> Avyakta Ravaha. Because of choking, he could not even make a sound. Nyapatat <clears throat> fell down. Sahabala with the child, Vyasu Rajay, lifeless on the ground of Raja. Translation. While Krishna, grasping him by the throat, Trinavarta choked, unable to make even a sound or even to move his hands and legs. His eyes popping out, the demon lost his life and fell, along with the little boy down to the ground of Raja. Text 28. Tam adikshat patitam silayam vishina sarva vayavana kalaram puram yata rudra sarena vidham striyo rudatyo dadrishur sameta. Translation purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. While the gopis who had gathered were crying for Krishna, 
The demon fell from the sky onto a big slab of stone, his limbs dislocated as if he had been pierced by the arrow of Lord Shiva like Tripura Asura. Purport. In transcendental life, as soon as devotees of the Lord merge in lamentation, they immediately experience the Lord's transcendental activities and merge into transcendental bliss. Actually, such devotees are always in transcendental bliss, bliss, and such apparent calamities provide a further impetus for that bliss. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadanti Swam Padanti Kam Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Sisi Radha Gopinath Ji Ki Jai Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai so why does Krishna do all that? He just increases the lamentation of his devotees, the anxiety of his devotees, puts them in such difficult situations. Right? For Krishna to, to kill a demon, he doesn't even have to think. He can automatically arrange something to happen and the demon is finished. It, only by his will, Krishna's power is complete and perfect, and there's nothing he cannot do. In fact, there's even the inconceivable by our limited understanding of conceivable and inconceivable, he can do. He can do anything. <clears throat> That's the nature of God. <clears throat> he means all-powerful not just all-powerful in certain situations, but always all-powerful, whether he's a little child on the lap of his mother, or he's fighting on the battlefield of Kudushetra, driving the chariot for Arjun. He's always the same supreme, all-powerful personality of Godhead. <clears throat> but he performs this adventure. He was sitting on the lap of his mother, <clears throat> And then he could understand this demon is coming to try to kill me. So what did he do? He just became heavy. He's so heavy that his mother couldn't hold him anymore and she had to put him on the ground. Which allowed for the demon to come and pick him up. And Krishna went for a ride. <laughs> you know, sometimes they put little kids on these rides and the kids go, ah, and the parents are waving, oh, you're having good fun, you know. So Krishna was having fun, <clears throat> just flying in the sky with this demon. But then, seeing his devotees in such anxiety, he decided to end his pastime. So he just grabbed the demon by the neck. <coughs> Not something like that, anyway. <clears throat> and he just choked him so much that he couldn't even talk. <laughs> couldn't make any sounds. Demons like to make noise, but he was a silent, dying demon. <laughs> And his eyes were like popcorn, boom, boom, <laughs> popping out of his sockets. And he was just flying down. And he did two things. <clears throat> he was trying to throw Krishna off. He couldn't throw Krishna off. He couldn't throw Krishna off. And Krishna just kept holding on, then all the way down. But, what, but, the, but the point that's being made here is that the residents of Vrindavan were in such anxiety just experiencing Krishna being put into danger. And their anxiety caused them what they call great, great amounts of lamentation. And this is, the, this is what's being illustrated here. That they lamented so much that they were practically on the verge of death. For, for Krishna, for them, Krishna is everything. Krishna is more dear than their own life. That is the residence of Vrindavan. They could give up their own life easy, but they could never give up Krishna. It would be easy for them to give up their life, but to give up Krishna, that's worse. That's impossible. 
But to see Krishna being put into that situation caused them such lamentation that you can imagine. And Krishna does this all the time. He always does that to his devotees. He puts them in difficult situations where it appears that the evil forces, demoniac forces, materialistic forces are somehow overpowering the Lord or the Lord's devotees like that. But for Krishna, it's just simply his leelas. <laughs> He's having, what is he doing? He's increasing the love of his devotees. Not increasing their love, their love cannot be increased. He's increasing their expression of love. That expression is being manifested here. And as Prabhupada so nicely explains that the devotees of the Lord are always in transcendental bliss. And when put into these situation, their bliss increases. So when you think about it, how can lamentation, we hear about the word lamentation, and we, we describe it in different ways that this material world is like a football field. Well, of course, American style football, or any kind of football actually, where there's two teams and they're kicking the ball from side to side, and both are trying to reach the goal. So the ball is going from one end to the other, back and forth. So this material world is sometimes described like that, as that there are two things, hankering and lamentation. The conditioned soul wants something, and tries very difficult, makes so many arrangements, even sacrifices to get it. And when they don't get it, they lament. Or if they get it, many times they do get it, what they expect from it causes them lamentation anyway. Either they lose it or it causes them misfortune in due course of time. So this material world is seen in that same way that the materialists are always hankering after something and lamenting when they don't either achieve it or lose it or not find the happiness they expect from it. This is the nature of the material world. So lamentation is considered to be one of the uh, deficiencies of the conditioned soul, to lament. Don't lament. People, sometimes we say about that, don't lament. Don't lament about what you can't control. People lament because they try to be the controller, and they're not the controller, therefore lamentation is the feature of not being able to control or not be able to enjoy. Mm -hmm. But here, there's another, lamentation is considered to be, in this context, to be something wonderful. <laughs> Same lamentation, but directed to the source or Krishna. So when the gopis or Krishna's devotees lament about Krishna's situation, or we might even take it on a broader level, when devotees do their service and they lament that my service is not really nice enough, I wish I could have performed the service, let me say, in better consciousness, or I could have performed the service with greater attention, Sometimes there's some lamentation about the quality of what we're trying to offer to Krishna, either devotionally or in the sense of the practical aspect of it. But that's spiritual. And Prabhupada actually mentions this, that when a devotee has that mood, it's the sign of advancement. <laughs> it's a sign of advancement. When one feels a sense of lamentation, because, or anxiety by not be able to offer what we feel we should be able to offer to the Lord. And Prabhupada said this type of lamentation increases the devotee's devotional life. Whereas the lamentation of the materialists or any lamentation done in relationship to the material energy just makes one feel unhappy. But this type of unhappiness that the devotees experience inspires them to try to increase the quality of their service. So therefore, it is actually considered to be auspicious, or even what we say, desirable, very desirable. Uh, 
all the apparent negative qualities that we describe, such as lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, when connected with Krishna, is actually spiritual. There's only one thing that you cannot connect to the spiritual energy, and that is envy, matsarya. Prabhupada said, matsarya has to be getting rid of. Spiritual, there's no such thing, or there's no, devotees don't try to be spiritually envious. <laughs> envy is the quality that keeps the conditioned soul, what we say, locked into the illusion of this material life and trying to be the enjoyer and not experiencing what they expect and feeling unhappy towards others and toward unhappy towards God and the way God treats me. God is not treating me nice. So, but all the other qualities, even lamentation, anxiety, what else? Even illusion, there is called spiritual illusion. That is called, uh, Krishna is called Madan Mohan. He creates a spiritual illusion. What is that spiritual illusion? That he performs his leelas like an ordinary person, but actually, they're not ordinary in any sense. They're actually extraordinary, whereas they bring the devotee closer and closer to his lotus feet in loving service. So the gopis, here, specifically, this is connected to the gopis. They're watching Krishna up in the sky with this demon. You can imagine what they're experiencing. It's, you know, they're practically on the verge of death. And seeing Krishna somehow being put into that situation. And when Krishna just takes his devotee to the edge, and then he lets it off. <laughs> He does that to his devotees. He did that when he was killing Kaliya, or dancing on the heads of Kaliya in, this, in the lake. All the inhabitants of Vrindavan saw Krishna caught in the coils of Kaliya, serpent. And Krishna was there for two hours, held by this multi-serpent with a hundred different heads, wrapped up, breathing fire. And the residents of Vrindavan were on the verge of death. They wanted to jump into the lake to see if they could save Krishna. But by the power of Balaram, they were checked. Because Balaram knew what was happening. He could understand Krishna's leelas. And therefore, they weren't able to go. But Mother Yasoda practically, she lost consciousness just watching Krishna being caught into the... And then Krishna, at one point, he just... He freed himself and just started dancing on the heads of Kaliya. So why does Krishna do that to his devotees? Sometimes he does that in, in even in our life. He puts us in a situation where it looks like, you know, there's no hope. <laughs> sometimes he puts us, sometimes he takes away our money or our health or something. And then he just sees how we're going to respond to that. And if we surrender to him more and more, he f we feel happy, despite the apparent difficulties. Sometimes devotees go out in Sankirtan and have to experience great difficulties. And Krishna allows that to happen in order to somehow increase our devotion, increase our, our love for him. And that's how Krishna works. Sometimes when Krishna sees a devotee being very successful in their devotional service, making a lot of, you know, doing a lot of service or preaching or so many things, he just changes that for a second just to see how the devotee will react, whether the devotee is attached to the results or is attached to him. That's Krishna. <laughs> So, but if a devotee knows that in all circumstances, one never loses their, what we say, faith in Krishna. Neophyte devotees may lose some faith, depending on circumstances. Why did Krishna allow this to happen? There's a story. Would you like to hear a little story? It's a nice little story. We can't understand Krishna's plan. There was once 
this temple, and it was a nice temple, there was a deity of Narayan there. And people were coming in and offering puja, prayers, and so many gifts. And obviously people were coming to pray for material things. So there was one temple cleaner who would stay in the temple throughout the day and he would clean, he would be there all day. And he would watch the, the different pilgrims coming in and offering prayers day after day. And he was thinking, you know, he was a simple man. He was thinking, well, I wonder what it's like to be the Lord sitting there and listening to all these prayers all day. <laughs> I wonder what he's experiencing just listening to everybody's prayers. So that night he went to sleep and he had a dream. And the Lord said, oh, you want to experience what I'm experiencing? Okay, you can do that for one day. Tomorrow you can be me. But there's one rule. You don't say anything. You just stand there. Don't, under no circumstances, do you say anything. So he thought, wow, I get to be the Lord for one day. <laughs> Some people like to be the Lord their whole life. <laughs> but he said, all right, so... He was standing there, and then this one very rich man came in, and he started offering nice prayers, and he takes out his wallet, and he offers a big donation to the hundi right in front of the deity, and he's just, you know, praying to the Lord that he can make more money. <laughs> you know, that's the program. You give some money down, and you, it's like an investment, you know, and Krish, Krishna's the stockbroker. <laughs> So he put it in the Krishna file. So in his enthusiasm, he forgot his wallet and he left. So one poor man came up and he was praying, my dear Lord, I don't have any money, I don't have any food. My wife, she's living in a very broken down house. We're so poor. And he offered nice prayers to the Lord. And then, he was asking for something because he was barely able to eat. And then he looks down, he sees his wallet. Oh, the Lord fulfilled my desire. <laughs> so he picks up the wallet and he leaves. Oh, Krishna really reciprocated quite fast. <laughs> and then this next person comes in, it's a sailor. And the sailor is saying, my dear Lord, I'm about to go on a very dangerous sea journey tomorrow. And please protect me against so many dangers. He's praying like that for his own safety. And then the rich man comes back and he's looking for his wallet. He can't find it. He sees the sailor. He blames the sailor. Hey, you took my wallet. I just left here and you're the only person who came that I can see. You're, you took my wallet. And he's angry. And the sailor's saying, no, I didn't do it. I didn't take your wallet. And he's, the man is just, he's really an arrogant person. And he's really angry, so he calls the police and he says, this man stole my wallet, now he's trying to lie about it. And it's going back and forth, and he's, in there, he's, he's standing there and he's thinking, I'm not supposed to say anything, but I have to say something. So the deity starts to speak. No, it wasn't the sailor that did it. Actually, he didn't do it. And then everybody, oh, the police and, the, the, you know, the, the, oh, Krishna spoke, the Lord spoke. And then the, the, everybody pays their obeisances. Oh, and then the man apologizes to the sailor. I'm sorry, I blamed you, Krishna. So, so they all left after some time. And then the Lord, that night, he said, I told you not to say anything. You're supposed to be up there, keep quiet. He said, that rich man, he's so greedy. He makes all his money by cheating. I, I arranged for him to lose his wallet. And that poor man, he's, he's my devotee. He's hardly being able to eat, so I arranged for him to get a little money. And that sailor, he was going to go into this dangerous journey, and he was supposed to die on that journey, but I, I arranged to him to go to jail instead. So you ruined my whole plan. <laughs> so, apparently... What we see is not always the whole picture. It never, it never is the whole picture. So Krishna has, you know, Krishna always puts his devotees into difficult situations. Sometimes we can't see why Krishna is doing that. Many times we... But a devotee never lose faith. A devotee never lose faith. 
the Brajabhasis, they, their only concern is Krishna. Krishna is in a dangerous situation. So what can we do? And they were helpless against these demons. One after another, so many demons came to Vrindavan. Trinavarta is, I think he's just the third demon that we know of. There was Putana, there was Sakatasura, the cart demon. Now we hear about Trinavarta. But Prabhupada writes and speaks that every day two demons were coming to Vrindavan, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, on schedule. And Krishna was dispatching them to the abode of Yamaraj regularly. So the ones we hear are the most prominent ones. There were so many demons. So that the, the, the Brajabhasis were always being either filled with transcendental fear for Krishna or transcendental anxiety about these demons coming in and attacking them. So this is what it means to be a devotee. <laughs> Those of you who want to understand the deeper levels of devotional service, that you can expect difficulties. And one is that Prabhupada said, if you think that you come to Krishna consciousness and everything is so nice and rosy, he says the only rosy means going back home, back to Godhead. <laughs> While you're in this material world, there's always difficulties. There's always reverses. But a devotee never lose faith in Krishna, nor does he give up his service. The materialists, when things go wrong, they always lose their faith in whatever they're doing, and they become either angry or they lament. Mm -hmm. It's like we have the example of Srila Bhakti Tirtha Swami. When he was leaving his body, he was racked with such a painful disease. It's described that this cancer was permeating his entire bones. Cancer was in the bones, and the most painful form of cancer, constant pain. Even pain killers weren't able to relieve the pain fully. Uh, but he was hearing Chaitanya Charitamrita from Radhana Swami Maharaj was, was reading the leelas of Lord Chaitanya and the Lord Chaitanya's pure devotees. He was in ecstasy. He was in ecstasy. This hearing, you know, the pastimes of the Lord from a great soul. And he was thinking, this is Brindavan. <laughs> this is Brindavan. He was enjoying the, the bliss of Krishna consciousness. So whether Krishna puts you in a difficult circumstances or he puts himself in a situation where it appears, just like we th even hear, just like how do Krishna puts his devotees in a circumstance where we may lose the temple. Just like in Hungary, the devotees were forced into a situation where they made some laws where they had to re-register as a, uh, a religion again and they had to have certain qualifications in order to become a religion. Uh, 64 different religions in the, no, there was, no, I'm sorry, over 300 different religions and 64 of them were only considered to be bona fide. And what happened was, the devote, I remember I was going to Hungary at the time and the devotees were in such anxiety, we're going to lose our farm, we're going to lose our temple, we're going to lose everything. But speaking to Shiva Ram Maharaj, he understood it was Krishna's pastime. Of course, he was also concerned that we might lose, but Krishna does that. He puts some devotees in a situation where he forces the devotees to take greater shelter and fight on his behalf. But Krishna is always in control. He never loses control <laughs> of any situation. And so this is Krishna consciousness. And it's very difficult when you're in the situation to see how Krishna is doing things. All you can do is pray to Krishna, take shelter of Krishna, and use your intelligence to deal with the situation, whatever situation he puts his devotee in. The, the, the gopis, they were helpless. What can they do? All they could do is cry. <laughs> That's all they could do against this big fierce demon who had grabbed little baby Krishna. Krishna was like, he was what, three months old? Something like that. He was really a 
practically a, maybe a little older, but he was hardly, a, you know, not even a little child. He was still in the baby form yet. And they were just thinking, oh, what to do? Imagine Mother Yasoda, what she was going through. <laughs> and Krishna da does that, puts his, the devotees in difficult situations. Just to... He called the devotee, the gopis in the middle of the night by his playing of his sweet flute. All the gopis were with their families or doing household chores or other, or sleeping. And he, by the sound of his transcendental flute, he charmed their hearts. And they left everything. They forgot about everything. In fact, they even, coming to Krishna, they didn't even dress properly. They put the bottom parts of their clothes on the top part of their body and the bottom, top part on the bottom part. They were so, what well, you say, mesmerized and transcendental love to go to Krishna. And when they got there, Krishna said, what are you doing here? Go back. You're in the middle, you're young girls, you're in the middle of the forest with a young boy. Don't you know you'll lose all your social status, you'll be vilified, you'll be criticized. So many things. And he just left. So for the neophyte devotees, Krishna doesn't give too many tests like that. Because they're, they're already tested by just trying to chant Hare Krishna <laughs> and getting along with the other devotees. <laughs> But when, as one becomes more and more fixed in devotional service, Krishna gives you more and more tests. Don't get to the point and think, when will a test ever end? The, the question should be, when will I be able to accept the test as Krishna's mercy? That's, that's the proper consciousness of devotee to be willing to accept whatever Krishna gives. And for some, he tests his really strongly and for others makes it so I say simple sometimes devotees think why am I always getting tested <laughs> that means you're fortunate <laughs> you're fortunate because these tests or these situations just bring out the quality of a devotee's devotion makes them more and more attached to Krishna if Krishna were to make it easy or there wouldn't be any tests, then we would be easily led away by material things. Because material energy is powerful. And we're still very much, what we say, within it and surrounded by its activities. So unless Krishna gives us a chance to show our devotion through these different tests. Prabhupada said, one should take a risk for Krishna. But not a risk where your, devo your devotional life will become, mostly covered over. What are those risks for Krishna? One should try to preach. That's the risk. Because the preaching in Kali Yuga is difficult. Because people really don't want it in the sense of what we're giving. They want it in a different way. They want spiritual life, some of them but they want material happiness along with it. But we say, you know, we're preaching, and depending on the audience, we're trying to gradually bring them to the... But ultimately, we, we speak that ultimately this material world is not your home, and everything in it is simply meant for your defeat. <laughs> That's ultimately the principles of preaching, that don't try to be happy here. But people don't want that. <laughs> and they even come to devotional service and try to be happy in devotional service. Devotional service is a process for becoming happy. But Prahlad Maharaj gives the formula that if you want to be happy, don't try for it. Make sense? <laughs> don't try for something that is natural. To be happy is natural. It's the quality of the soul. It's the quality of the, our existence. But if you want to be happy, just try to serve. And so try to serve in such a way that you become absorbed in what you're doing and you want to offer that. Those who are absorbed in service are happy. And what does it mean to be absorbed in service? They're always thinking how to serve. Mm -hmm. 
It's not about getting free from material suffering. It's not about enjoying, enjoying. It's simply about service. That's devotional life. How to serve Krishna. That's all. And in this situation, the gopis are, have reached the platform of pure love through their service. So their service now is to simply show their love to Krishna in different ways. And, hope, and hopefully that Krishna will be pleased by their love. In this sense, their love is coming out in the form of lamentation. That Krishna is in danger and we can't do anything. But Prabhupada gives the formula, or gives the understanding. This lamentation provides a greater impotence for their spiritual happiness. Amazing, huh? When you think about it. How lamentation can increase transcendental ecstasies and happiness. Unbelievable. But that's the nature of love. That the object, anything in relationship to Krishna is transcendental or perfect. So therefore, any of the apparent negativities that people experience in the material world, when, when geared towards Krishna, are actually sources of transcendental service and happiness like that. Just like it explains that there are, on the higher level of bhakti, there are certain symptoms of transcendental happiness and one of them is death. <laughs> you get so happy you die. <laughs> And that's a hard one to explain, <laughs> but it's mentioned that Radharani's love for Krishna is so great that she, that she can't even think of being separated from Krishna, and she'd rather be she she experiencing death, just like when Krishna left Vrindavan, he said something to the gopis that sort of made them feel happy, but at the same time caused them great unhappiness. And what was that? He said, I'll be back. <laughs> so every night, the, the gopis and cowherd boys, and the residents of Vrindavan, they would go to the edge of Vrindavan looking for Krishna to return. Krishna wouldn't return. And this went on year after year. So Radhara, in Radharani's ecstasy, she says that, you know, she chastises Krishna in a very loving way. She calls him, you're like a herdsman who has animals and you've locked the animals in the house and they can't get out. And, the fi and there's a fire in the house also. And the animals are trying to get out of the house but the door is locked. She said, I'm like that. You, I'm burning in the fire of lamentation and se separation from you. And I want to get out. I want to leave this body, but I can't because you have said, I'll be back. <laughs> so with the hope of Krishna coming back, they continue their existence. Like that. So in our devotional service, we also hope, we pray one day, we'll reach the stage of pure love for Krishna. That's our, that is guaranteed for one who perseveres in all circumstances. Love of God is guaranteed for one who perseveres in all circumstances. In other words, one who is willing to accept whatever Krishna sends in the way of devotional service. Because love is shown by accepting hardships or, or difficulties. Or we always, you know, in our ordinary parlance, sometimes we say, oh, this is difficult. But in our hearts, we know it's not really difficult. It's Krishna's service. <laughs> in our hearts, we're, we're really happy with the difficulties. But externally, we're struggling with the situation. Because we know that actually it's sent by Krishna. So, for a devotee, Everything is auspicious. And for a non-devotee, nothing is auspicious. <laughs> because they're on the wrong track. Anything in the material world simply leads to what we say, disappointment, at best. Disappointment is the greatest, what we say, boon you can get. It's usually worse than that. <laughs> 
you can become disappointed, you, that's pretty mild. Usually it's anger, lamentation, uh, suicide, something, you know. People just look at the people's lives out there. That's suicide. The way they live is a form of suicide. They know it too, they're killing themselves. But for sense gratification, they'll commit suicide. <laughs> To live, you know, to struggle hard just to make some money to enjoy something you can't enjoy. <laughs> you work hard just for something that causes you to suffer. Arivo. Yeah, that's material life. You have to work, struggle, use your time, your energy, whatever else you have to get something which will cause you defeat. Arivo. Welcome to the material world. <laughs> Whereas a devotee, even a little devotional service, even if it's imperfectly offered, brings one closer to the goal of life, pure love of God. So nothing in a material world, and that's explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the first canto. Even if a devotee engages in devotional service and because of some situation doesn't become perfect, fall down, it says, what is the loss? There's no loss. And what is the gain for one who is perfect in material life? There's no gain. Because everything is taken away. And or even if there's a little happiness in between because of some material success, it's also gone within a few moments. So, therefore, although we see the residents of Vrindavan apparently in great transcendental anxiety, lamentation, unhappiness, they're in bliss. <laughs> they're in total bliss, experiencing what apparently is to be something inauspicious, from our point of view, anyway. Okay. Stop here. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Gaura Premanandi Hari Hari Bhagavatam.